Hi, I'm Mark Friedman, Chairman of the Midsize Retirement and Healthcare Plan Management Conferences. I have Joel Shapiro with me today, who is with 401k 403b Advisors. Uh, today is St. Patty's Day. You may not be able to see it, but Joel is wearing some lovely shamrock socks. Uh, it's also March Madness. I've got my Jimmy V basketball tie on, so we're all set for this. Excellent. So. One of the things Joel and I have been discussing throughout the day, Joel was a keynote speaker for us here in San Francisco, is the whole area of automatic enrollment. It's been well documented how successful automatic enrollment has been in getting people, particularly new participants, into a plan. But one of the areas that people don't always think about are the existing participants. So most plans have a whole array of people that are in their plan that aren't investing at the levels that we set in these automatic enrollment programs. And we'll get to the proper levels for the investments in a minute. But what do you recommend doing for the people that are already in these plans? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, When automatic enrollment was uh, first introduced to the industry, um, uh, there was a a great appetite for the outcome, which was going to be increasing participation and, you know, getting deferral rates up and and even um, better outcomes from an investment perspective. But as is typically the case with human nature, people like to get their toes wet before they jump in. And so we saw a lot of organizations that implemented automatic enrollment for new hires only. And the obvious question to those of us in the industry then just became, well, why would you treat your new employees any better than you would treat your old employees? Don't your old employees, uh, your current employees, deserve the same uh, protective treatment that automatic enrollment would provide? And so... By and large, we're very large proponents of automatic enrollment across the board for your current uh, participants or current employees, whether they be enrolled or not, um, as well as your new. Because the fact of the matter is, even for those that are already in the plan, um, they might not be deferring at a high enough rate. And so if you've got people in the plan that are deferring at 2% or 3% and you're going to set your automatic enrollment at 5 or 6%, it's a great opportunity to roll everybody up to a, a more appropriate deferral rate. And one of the things a lot of plan sponsors haven't realized is that this notion of people having to opt out, which is the core of automatic enrollment, used to be that you had to opt into the retirement plan. Now you're automatically in it unless you're, you opt out. That same thing can be done on a re-enrollment for your existing employees. You can go in and say to all the employees, you're not participating, you're automatically participating unless you tell us otherwise, you're not participating at a high enough level that's the same as our automatic enrollment percentages, you now are unless you tell us that you're not, correct? Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that, that also carries over into the investment side of the equation as well. Uh, Most participants don't have the investment savvy to be properly diversified. And so here's an opportunity for you. If you're going to reset their elections, why not reset all of their elections, including their investment election? It's a great opportunity for you to more fully leverage your QDIA, your Qualified Default Investment Alternative, which should be a pre-diversified fund, like a target date fund or a risk-based model, something along those lines. You can do that with your current participants as well. You, you erase their deferral percentage election, you erase their, their current uh, investment election, you get them in at a more appropriate deferral rate and in a better diversified portfolio, and these participants are light years ahead of where they were just prior. Let me ask you two questions about that whole concept of an investment re-enrollment that I know there's a lot of misconception out there. The first one is that you don't have to do an investment re-enrollment coupled with an automatic enrollment or any other thing. You can just do an investment re-enrollment by itself, can you not? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you're right. I think a lot of people have a misperception about the fact that that has to be coupled with a full automatic re-enrollment. And the fact of the matter is, as long as you give participants the ability to opt out of and or choose their own investment options, you can wipe out all of their investment elections without doing a full a complete re-enrollment and just re-establish the QDIA with them. And that's a great way, again, if the QDIA didn't exist when those participants first got in the plan, to get them in a better diversified portfolio moving forward. The other misconception that I think is out there is that these investment re-enrollments can only be done if you're changing providers. So for instance, you're going from provider X to provider Y, you remap employees and you could either remap them into like funds or you could remap them into a QDIA. That's not true, is it? No, it, it's absolutely not true. I think that the reason that that misperception exists um, is because it tends to be maybe a more optimal time to do it. You know, you're making a lot of changes. You have to choose some investments. 
Uh, there's going to be some default opportunity, so people take that as an opportunity to do so, but it's not limited to that scenario. You can certainly do it with your current incumbent provider. Right. I'm going to ask you another question that I know you're very passionate about, and that's the base rate and automatic escalation that should be set in retirement plans. The by far uh, highest uh, combination that you see is a six percent match on a three percent a three percent match on a six percent employee contribution fifty percent on the dollar for your first six percent mm -hmm. that's too low most experts say you need twelve to fifteen percent over the course of your career going into a retirement plan what do you recommend to fix that yeah that's a that's a great point and um, you know we're always happy to see that plans do offer a match and they implement automatic enrollment and they implement auto automatic escalation, but unfortunately, they're selling their, their plan and their participants short oftentimes. So our recommendation is to do three things, really. Um, one is let's set automatic enrollment at a high enough level that it's going to be more impactful. It's going to give those participants a jump start. So let's set that at 6%, 7% where you're going to really have an impactful opportunity for the participant to put in a fair amount of money. Um, studies have shown that the opt-out rate, even at those higher levels, doesn't change from 3% to 6% to 7%. It still remains about 10 or 11% of an opt-out rate. So that means participants aren't less uh, willing to, to defer just because you've made the automatic deferral a little bit higher. Um, in addition, automatic escalation, what we're seeing a lot of is 1%, which is great. You know, you're getting participants to step forward at least, you know, once a year. Um, but again, we're seeing that the opt-out rate doesn't change if you change that to 2%, which again gets the participants to that 12, 13, 14, 15% savings rate a whole lot faster. Um, in addition, um, if your organization is having a little bit of a difficult time in adding something like the automatic enrollment features, Another way to drive participant behavior is spreading the match. So you, you talked about 50 cents on the dollar up to 6%. You know, that's a 3% match, right? That's a total contribution between employee and employer of about 9%. Well, a better idea is let's stretch that out. Let's do 30 cents on the dollar up to, up, up to 10%. That way, it's still going to be a 3% match, right? It's not more expensive to the employer. But now, at the end of the day, the employee plus employer portion is going to be 13% contribution. That's going to drive participant success a lot more quickly. That is such an important concept. I highly recommend to those of you watching this in your office, go hit the rewind button and watch that again. You just drove up the contribution that an employee is going to have from 9% to 13% without costing the employer a cent. There's another really important concept that goes along with that. Employees believe that whatever you're recommending as your default very often, you being the company here, that's what you're recommending to them to save for retirement. So if you're setting those levels too low, they're going to follow the lead and go with the default. And if you set those levels higher, they're going to save more. And that's borne out by the statistics that show that very few people opt out and the level of, of contribution doesn't have an impact on yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, participants anchor around what their employers suggest. And uh, a lot of uh, plan sponsors suggest inadvertently and it's just plan design. Your plan design is going to drive participant action. So if you want to drive participants to do the right thing, um, make your match at a higher percentage because participants take that as advice as to how much they should be deferring. Yep. Joel, I really appreciate it. You and I could go on talking about these things forever. But, uh, thank you so much for speaking for us today and for appearing on this video. Oh, my pleasure.